Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to the best thriller writers in the world. Now, while I don't put myself in that category of the best, I've certainly got my hat now in the ring. And after nearly three years of hosting this podcast, I think it's time to toot my own horn, if you will. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale all this month. It stars Detective Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat in Hollywood when one of the town's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home only hours hours after winning an Oscar. Beloved by her fans, Pat thinks someone wants this star dead and sees this as a way to forge her own path and get the promotion she craves. I'm proud of the response I've gotten from fans and I'm confident you're going to like The Poser. So for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only five bucks or the paperback for 14. Since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this as a way to help out a fellow thriller writer. There are two ways to reach the link. First, you can go to David Temple Books. Dot com. Scroll down to see The Poser. Click and you're on your way. Or head over to Amazon. You can find it there. Again, davidtemplebooks.com or Amazon. Thanks in advance for your support. And now, on with the show. Hi, folks. This is David Temple. Before we start the show, a quick little note. We had some technical difficulties during the making of the show. We had a power outage on my end. We had a technical issue on Brad Taylor's end. And along the way, there's a couple little hiccups, or as my grandmother used to say, uh, hitches in the giddy up. So bear with me, if you would please, about the five minute point, you're gonna, you're gonna hear the conversation drop off, go to silence. Do not adjust your set. Everything's perfectly okay. So I'm just telling you this up front. Thank you so much. Now let's get on with the show as Brad Taylor kicks off our new season of The Thriller Zone. The Thriller Zone begins now. Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. And I got to say a great big welcome to season four of The Thriller Zone. Wow, can you believe it? Season four, now over 18 months into the show. I remember just like it was yesterday, our very first guest. I knew I wanted to write a novel about someone's life that goes off the rails because I love those books and I love those films. Right. There is sort of this sort of insane pressure on women, I think, in particular, to be happy and to present yourself as very happy on social media all the time. And I, I just think not enough is discussed about how, like, monotonous and boring motherhood can be. Wow. That seems like forever ago. And then again, it seems like just last month. May Cobb, she was number one. Here we are, 100 and what, 15 or so later, season four, a new year, 2023. Brad Taylor is coming out with, oh, look at this, The Devil's Ransom, dropping next week, Tuesday, January 24th. I had a chance to sit down with Brad. When I first met him, I'm going to be honest with you, I wasn't quite sure how to read him. He's one of those guys that's like, Hello. Yeah. Great. And he's always kind of watching the room. Must be that Delta Force background, right? Just always seeing where the exits are. Then you get to meet him and he's just a chill Southern boy like myself, kind of laid back, easy going. Oh, and a prolific writer. This marks number 17, 17, baby, the devil's ransom. So, how about you and I get on in to the Thriller Zone? Now, in our fourth season, please welcome Brad Taylor. First of all, welcome Brad Taylor to the Thriller Zone. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I cannot, I cannot believe, believe it has been taken us this long to find the hookup. We're going to talk about that. Let me turn the volume up here. But um, you are, I don't know if you knew this, I, I should have sent balloons and flowers and everything. You're the inaugural debut of season four for the Thriller Zone, now in our 19th month. Very cool. I know you got chills right now, don't you? You just <laughs> tingling all over. <laughs> I'm surprised I haven't been on before either. Um, I actually thought I had been on. I went and Googled all your uh, past episodes and I was like, well, it looks like I wasn't on. Yeah. And I'm, you know, that was going to be one of my starting comments. Hard to believe it's been 18 months on the podcast. You're one of the biggest names in the biz. And I'm not saying that just to blow skirt up, you know, heat up your skirt, but 
And I, and I'm just now talking to you and I'm like, how does that happen? I don't know. <laughs> but fortunately I bumped into you at Thriller Fest, got up yeah, in your yeah, face. Yeah. Either way you're here. And I wanted to do this as we warm up a uh, little side note. Uh, we were under a power outage, San Diego. It doesn't rain in San Diego. I, I think you probably right, know right. that. Yeah. And in the last three days, we've had more rain in the last three days than we have in the last three years, practically. And at 8.21, my time, all power went off. And I'm like, oh, my. Really? Brad Taylor? New season? So I'm like, deep breath. It's the universe saying, we're going to test you a little bit or whatever. You want to fill that blank in. And literally at nine minutes to the hour, it came back on. I actually had an email drafted to your publicist going, we might have to reschedule, which I never, ever try to do. And I'm like, I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to have faith and wait. Well, at that exact moment, I was furiously trying to get my browser to work. So it worked out. And see, I learned something new. There's a new browser out there called... Brave, I never knew about that. And I thought about uh, new all browsers. So I'm very excited about that. But I do want to start off the the um, show with doing, I want to do exactly what Elmore Leonard says, do not do. And that's start a story about the weather. <laughs> so that's what I want to start. So we're having these torrential rain pours. And you're in Charleston area uh, where you're living. And I'm thinking to myself, how is life out there? Let's just, you know, warm up that way. It's, it's actually really good right now. We had the, uh, you know, the Arctic blast that came through. And um, I unfortunately told my wife, we don't need to move the plants inside. They'll be okay next to the house. It's not going to get that cold. And they all died. So <laughs> She'll never believe me again. Oh, gosh. Yeah, you're in the doghouse now. Yeah. I love that area. Now, I spent... 20 years before moving out here, moving to New York and then out here to the West Coast, um, I spent, I was in Charlotte. So I spent a lot of time in Charleston. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many summers I spent on Kiowa. My favorite is probably Folly Beach, mm -hmm. Sullivan's Island. I did work in Mount Pleasant. So you're, you're right there in that thick of that, aren't you? It's one of the, it's like the perfect little town, in my opinion. Mount Pleasant is. All right, then I'll tell you what I'll do, Brad. I will help you go. This is now on the top of the worst places to visit. Right. Yeah. All right. So having grown up in rural Texas, which you're, you're, you're very familiar with heat. What's your favorite part? And, and then we'll move on to real stuff. What's your favorite part of living in the South on the East coast rather than, you know, rural Texas? Well, we actually, uh, my family's from here, Mount Pleasant. My grandparents oh. lived here. My, um, my dad went to the Citadel. My mom grew up here. Um, and so I used to spend all my summers here, just like you were saying. So when the parents were like, you know, go see the grandparents, so I would spend the summers visiting my grandparents. And so I have a little bit of a history of the place. And my last uh, assignment in the military was teaching at the Citadel. And then I uh, just never left. Wow. Teaching at the Citadel. What was that like just for a moment? That uh, It was a lot of fun. It, it wasn't, uh, I mean, I came from a special mission unit at Fort Bragg and I was coming down here just to take a break, to be honest with you, just from deployments. And um I had a lot of time on my hands because, you know, teaching was a lot of fun, but it's kind of rinse and repeat. You know, once yeah. you go to the classes, you're teaching the same thing three times a day, you know, and then you do the next class and that kind of stuff. And uh, that's, I mean, actually, actually, when I wrote my first book, it was just because I had so much time I had, I wrote a book. The funny thing is, it's not that terribly dissimilar to the writing process, the teaching process, from the standpoint of you are doing a lot of the same mechanics over and over, albeit with a new thread of story. Yeah, actually, I would say that uh, uh, designing exercises, both in the Special Forces and I designed a couple of exercises for the cadets down here, adaptive leadership exercises. That's when you really have to build a script and because you, you want the guys to do exactly what you envision them doing, but they're human beings. They could do a thousand different things. They'd be running amok. 
And so you have to design a scenario in such a way that they will only do the one thing you want them to do within parameters. There's certain things they can do, but that's kind of like writing a book. Cause then you, you know, every time my main character Pike Logan does something, he can do a thousand things. He's going to do one thing. And now I have to show why did he not do 999 other things? We're going to get into uh, the devil's ransom here in a second. Uh, dropping 24th. I'm going to say this straight up. I'm late to the par. I'm late to the Brad Taylor party. I apologize in advance. I probably shouldn't admit that. However, I'm kind of one of those guys that just tells it like it is. So there. But I can see why there are 16 of them because this guy is like, uh, and I'm saying this because I, I finished the book this morning at 6.30. This guy feels like a guy you grew up with. Like I, I kept thinking of a couple of buddies that I grew up with. Real ballsy characters who weren't afraid of a lot and just kind of like, really? Well, we're going to we're gonna do it this way. And just can you give me an inside scoop of where this guy came from? And I, I love the name Pike. And again, I know I'm saying this for the first time. A lot of people go on real, Dave. Um, he's been around for 16. You want to give us a break? But where did he come from? Yeah, he's he's actually kind of an amalgamation of guys I served with. That, uh, but when I originally wrote the book, the original book, One Rough Man, when I was teaching, uh, what I set out to do was write a story of redemption. I didn't set out to write a military thriller. But you know, you Google, how do you write? And they say, well, write what you know. Uh, I was a special forces counter terrorist guy, so that's what Pike became. But uh, he was supposed to be. I mean, if I'd have been a police officer, he'd have been a cop. If I'd have been a priest, Jennifer would have been a nun. The story would have been the thread of the story. The arc of the story would have been the same. Um, but it would have, uh, I just made him because of who I am and what I know. You know, I hear this a lot, Brad. And I, 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 I've, all, I've always sat on the line just a little bit about the write what you know. It seems completely intuitive to write what you know because you have the whole world there at your feet of this vast amount of information that you're already well aware with. The other side, I know you have a vivid imagination because the way you craft stories is so uh, deep and wide, so you could create any kind of story you wanted to. So there's a part of me that says, yeah, but you know what? How about if Brad was uh, wanted to be a... I'm going to pull this out of nowhere, uh, uh, an attorney, like, you know, a secret agent attorney or something. Well, then I know that you could do that. But so where do you, do you sit on that fence? Do you go, I see both sides. Do you see, well, I, I went, I went with what I know. I went with what I know, but I certainly don't believe you have to do that. Right. Um, I mean, I do have, uh, Aaron and Shoshana are, uh, two Israeli assassins that work for Mossad. I've, I'm not Jewish, never worked in Israel. So that's a little bit of a, you know, I do a lot of research and try to form that out. But some of the best, I mean, uh, Crane wrote The Red Badge of Courage and he'd never served a day in his life. And it's one of the iconic war novels ever written. So I certainly don't think you, you know, you, you have to write what you know. For me, it was just, that was just the path I took. Well, I, I think one of the favorite things about your book, and you got to bear with me because this, this is going to sound a little bit odd at first. I'm one of those guys, I don't know why I do this, but I pick up a book. I will I might skim the blurb, but a lot of times I just want to be surprised by the story. That's just me. But for some reason, I love to go back to the acknowledgments and just see, you know, what's Brad about? Who's he thanking? Because if I know who you're thanking, they've been in your inner circle. It'll tell me a whole lot about you. And it just kind of cuts me to the chase of you. I mean, besides all the stalking I do of you on Instagram. Um, and while I was doing that, I, I loved it uh, where you were telling me exactly, you know, where you were traveling for research and all those fine details that added to the story. So I read that first and I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. Okay. So he went here and he studied that. Then as I'm reading the story, it was really cool because I don't know that I'd done this before quite this way. I went, oh, there's that hotel he researched. Oh, there's the, you know, the, uh, the courtyard that he did and, oh, the restaurants. And it's just, it was, it turned out to be really cool. Not everybody does that. A lot of people go, hey, I want to thank Bob and Sally and Frank for all their hard work. But you painted the picture of where you went to research. Tell me about that. Yeah, the, you mean the acknowledgments or the actual research itself? Yeah, well, both They're, because they blend together. The acknowledgments talk about the research, so yeah, either yeah, way. Yeah, the acknowledgments. Uh, I get a lot of fan mail about the acknowledgments on their own. Uh, yeah. So usually at the end of the book, I encapsulate you know everybody that's helped me out doing certain things. Sometimes it's 
the guy that I served with that, uh, uh, I mean, we were talking about fake and stuff, you know, so I'm not a combat diver. I'm, I'm a Patty certified scuba diver, but that's not combat diving with a Lars rebreather. So, you know, I wrote that scene and uh, I said, uh, um, I gave it to a buddy of mine who was a combat diver. And he's like, you screwed this all up. <laughs> so, you know, he tells me the nitty gritty on it. So I'll thank them and the acknowledgements. And um, we always, for the research, if I can get on the ground, I'm not like, uh, uh, I wish I could just look at Google Earth and, and figure it out, but I can't. Uh, and so if I can get on the ground in places, I'll definitely get on the ground and stomp around. Uh, I mean, I've written books that include North Korea. Of course, I'm not going there. Syria, I, you know, I talked a lot about Syria in a couple of books that uh, uh, I haven't been to Syria. I've been to Iraq, so I figured I could fake the funk on that. Um, but if I can get on the ground, usually what happens is uh, I'll have a list of stuff. I do a ton of research on the country I'm going to or countries, depending on the book. This one was primarily uh, Croatia. Uh, and I know what I'm looking for. So we start out at Zagreb, got a rental car and started hitting all these places. Uh, but there's always something out there that I don't know even exists. And I don't if it wasn't for uh, getting on the ground, I would never have found it. Uh, for instance, Game of Thrones is mentioned quite a bit in this book is because I had no idea they'd film that thing over there. And everywhere we went, there was some Game of Thrones thing. I was like, this is ridiculous. Every time I turned around, it was a Game of Thrones thing. So I threw it in the book. There was one thing that didn't make the book that I, I had no idea. It's not like a top tourist attraction for Croatia. Back when uh, Yugoslavia was around and Tito was around, he built an underground military airfield underneath, completely underneath the ground to withstand missile strikes and that kind of stuff. And I found out about that because I'm on the ground running around talking to people about stuff. And I'm like, man, I'm putting that in the book. So we tried to go over there and it's rings with landmines so you can't get in. So right. it, it didn't make the book. But those kind of things I never would have found. Uh, in fact, the culmination of the book is in Rostok, a small little quaint village uh, at the junction of two rivers with water wheels. It's a really neat place. And I wasn't looking for that, but we couldn't get to the airfield. So we had a half day to kill and we just drove down to that village. And I was like, man, this is really neat. And I ended up using it in the book. There's one thing that you you mentioned the acknowledgements, and it's hilarious because my wife and I are sitting at a stoplight on Friday night. We're coming back from dinner, and uh, it was maybe 55 degrees, which is kind of chilly for out here. And I looked to my left and sitting there in line, and I said to her, I said, the only place in America can you be wearing parkas, beanie caps, while still wearing flop flip-flops and shorts, and standing in line at a gelato line is San Diego, is Encinitas. So it made me think of your Croatia gelato and you went on about this. Now tell me what's the secret because you, you I think you even compared it to Italian, which I'm like, yeah. wait a minute, didn't they invent it? Right. I, you know, I've had Italian, real Italian gelato and uh, we have gelato stores here in Charleston and they're nowhere near as good as Croatia. I mean, I went and got some gelato when we came back. Uh, I was like, let's go try that new gelato store. And I was like, that's not gelato. <laughs> so when we were in Croatia. I went to this little, you know, on the street gelato guy got some gelato and it was just fabulous. So every time we went somewhere, they have, you know, kind of a Baskin Robbins type gelato place. It's in all these places. It's in Dubrovnik. It's in uh, split. You, you, I could saw the name and I'm like, that's one of those gelato places. Let's go get some gelato. And so everywhere we stopped, I'd get some. Now this begs the question because I know, uh, I know you like, you like good food. You like, you don't mind cooking uh, when it's your turn. If you were to make, have you ever tried to make gelato? And no, no, okay. No, I would have any idea how to do it. And, and, and what's the secret? What What's the one thing about? And I know I'm harbor uh, banging on it, but I just love this because I love food. So, what's the thing about the Croatian gelato that goes? Wow, this blows everyone else away. It's It's not as icy. Usually, uh -huh. when you get gelato, it's kind of an icy thing you eat with a spoon. This has got more texture to it, and so it's more like ice cream, but it's not ice cream. But right. it's more like ice cream, and it's uh, uh, it was just really good. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a short break, and when we come back, we're gonna really start diving into the Devil's Ransom, which is dropping on the 24th. You're with Brad Taylor, David Temple here on the Thriller Zone. David Temple here with a question: Do you love audiobooks? Yeah, me too. Do you love giveaways? Avanti Centre, author of the international best-selling Van Ops thriller series, has just released an award-winning standalone, Cleopatra's Vendetta. Critics are raving, calling it dangerous, intoxicating, rare, and action-packed. To celebrate, my friend Avanti is giving away an audiobook version of Cleopatra's Vendetta. 
and the latest audiobooks from James Rollins and Steve Barry. Just use the code THRILLERZONE for bonus entry points. If you'd like to enter, head over to vanops.net. That's V-A-N-O-P-S dot net. Enter today and good luck. Hey, before we get back to the show, I want to mention something. You just heard that commercial for uh, Avanti Centre. That book is dynamite, by the way. Which leads me to this. I'm going to turn this into a little bit of an advertisement because a lot of of my author friends are saying, you know, they say to me, hey, Dave, can I uh, advertise on the Thriller Zone? I'm like, well, sure. I mean, I'm kind of the perfect channel for it, right? And they go, yeah, you feature the best thriller writers in the world. I, meaning them, want to be one of the best thriller writers in the world. You have a captive audience. I'd like to advertise. I mean, these are my friends talking. I've tried Amazon. I've tried BookBub. I've tried Goodreads, etc. And I want to try uh, your show. And I'm like, bring it. Rates are reasonable. And you know I'm easy to work with. And uh, kind of a win-win. We're all in this together, right? So don't want to get heavy-handed. Just thought I'd throw that in there to you. All right, enough of that. Let's get back to the show. And now, back to the show. And welcome back to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. This is Brad Taylor, New York Times bestselling author of, guess what? Look at this thing, baby. Look Look at this. this. (laughs) Look at that. Devil's Ransom. I'm, uh, Brad, by the way, welcome back. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm a big fan of book covers, and I went back and did a little research on your book covers, and there's two things I learned. One is you got killer book covers who does them for you uh it it depends on the the covers we've gone through a little bit of a cycle on some of the covers and this one was uh um we went round and round on this cover round and round uh so i keep giving them input here's what i think it should be here's how i like and they'd send something back and um sometimes i liked it sometimes i didn't and we went uh i probably spent more time on this cover than i have in the past there's been times I will send them ideas and say, okay, like my last book was End of Days, which was uh, about the Knights of Malta. So it's a broken Maltese cross. It's a kind of a, uh, not a set piece, just a thing that's there. And um, so I sent them a bunch of crosses, say, because the first one that was on that cover, they put a Knights Templar cross on there, which is a completely different cross. And I said, you can't do that. I mean, somebody, I'll get emails, hate mail from everybody. Yeah. <laughs> we use the Maltese cross. Yeah, it's it's just... It's a stud. And, you know, when, whenever you get a, a quote on the bottom, Nelson DeMille says Brad Taylor knows his stuff. Anytime you get, folks, in case you're wondering, you want to become an author one day, you get a blurb like that, you're you're going to the moon. Okay, let's just say that. <sighs> nice. But let me tell you, folks, how I met Brad. Um, now, we only met face-to-face back in uh, last summer, Thriller Fest. Great to see you there. Great time, wasn't it? Yeah, that was the first time that Sharon, right? Yes, yes. Down there in uh, Times Square. Uh, such a great, by the way, big uh, shout out to ITW. Those folks know how to yeah. put, put together a party. But So that's the first time I met him face to face. But a few years ago, I was doing a little research on uh, websites because I'm like, you know what? I want to be one of those guys. I want to be an author. I mean, I write books, but... Not at your level, of course, but but I know that a presence, a web presence is, is key. So I started researching la, 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 la. Somehow, someone, either I ran across your website or someone sent it to me and I looked at it. I'm like, holy crap, that is the personification of what an author's website should look like. And that was just the way I saw it. And I'm scrolling down. I'm like, oh, my God, look at this cat. He's he's handsome. He's got on the leather jacket. The colors are cool. He's got this slider in the, oh, there's a photograph of him sitting on, you know. Look at these books. Oh, my God, this guy's a hitter, hitter. I go all the way to the bottom. All right, who, all right, who built this? Authorbytes.com. All right, now I got to find out who these clowns are. Fast forward a year and a half later, they're my prime sponsor of the Thriller Zone, Authorbytes.com. They've been really good to us. We I've been with them since I first started writing. To, in uh, I think we built that original website back in 2010, uh, and uh, I got some good advice. Uh, you know, the publisher doesn't do that. That's that's all on us. But the publisher gave me some good advice and said, uh, um, "Don't build your own website. You're, it's going to cost you some money because I wouldn't make any money as a writer at that time. So everything was like, I don't want to spend money on this. 
Uh, and he said, it's going to cost you some money, but you need to get a professional website. Uh, and so we did some research and just like you were saying, I came across somebody had, uh, we looked at a bunch of different offer websites and found one from author bites and I contacted him. Amazing. Anyway, I love synchronicity. If you listen to the show, you know, I love synchronicity. And so I saw that I'm like, Oh my God. I mean, Brad, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do straight up. Matter of fact. Oh yeah. You see this, you see this photograph here in the background. Notice what I'm wearing. I'm a real geek here. Leather, oh, ja- leather jacket. Leather jacket. Leather jacket. I see you. I'm like, okay, well, if if a guy this cool is wearing a leather jacket and a black shirt, I'm going to wear a leather jacket and a black shirt. And I know they're, they're my whole geek geekdom is now explored. explored. You want to know the history behind that leather jacket? Bring it. It's really embarrassing because I constantly, not constantly, but at least twice a year, someone will email me and say, where can I get a jacket like that? I went to a photography studio with a suitcase full of stuff to wear. And uh, I took a bunch of pictures, change clothes, take a bunch of pictures, change clothes, take a yep. bunch of pictures, change clothes. Uh, and most of them, I look like a JC Penney salesman, <laughs> you know, and I'm leaving the uh, studio. We're done, packed up, ready to go. And a photographer says, Hey, somebody left a leather jacket in the uh, studio here. You want to try that on? And I was like, sure. So I put it on. He took one more picture. And that's the one we ended up with. And I took that leather jacket off, put it back in a closet and left. I have no idea where it came from or how to get one. People are always asking me. I'm like, sorry, that thing was just thrown on me at the last minute. I love that. I never, you know, it's probably still hanging there as far as I know. See, dude, that this these are the kind of stories I geek out on. I don't know why, because you're like, oh, this guy, oh, Brad, he probably wore that when he was serving. This been with him forever. Look, it's it's worn here. He probably was in a fi- bar fight or something. You know, we make all this stuff up, and here it is. <laughs> oh, my I should have written down who had made it, because then I could tell people. They're, I just like, sorry about that. I don't know. I don't even know what the brand was. I just wow. put it on. I took a picture. I took it off. And then oh, we got the proofs back. It was like, that's the best one. I was like, the one with a jacket that I took walking out the door after all that work. I love that story. And to come full circle, once again, for my fans who like uh, Brad Taylor's work and want to get a website, I just got to throw a little bone at authorbytes.com because that's that to me is what the quintessential author's website should look like. So there I'm done. Well, they're easy to work with too. If you, I mean, we just send them like, we have a schedule, new books coming out, Devil's Ransom. That's going to be a new page. They know I'm going to put an excerpt up. They know all this stuff that's going to happen. And uh, the just, you know, it's kind of like clockwork. Here's, here's what we're doing next. Yeah. Let's go back to your friends, um, Jennifer Knuckles V. Love these guys. And Jennifer, by the way, I have to believe... Oh, what did you call her? I've got a note here. You call your wife the DCOE. Yeah. What's DCOE? Deputy Commander of Everything. <laughs> so she actually, uh, you know, I'm sitting here talking about how the website works and how that's this and that. She's the one that actually does the website. She, she does, uh, uh, you know, she interfaces with my publicity team, the marketing department. She does the book launch party we always do every year. She the research trips. I tell her I want to go here and she plans it out. I mean, one time I went to um, I went to Turkey and I wanted to go to Romania out of Turkey. And because uh, I'm geographically challenged, she was like, you know, Romania is not next to Turkey, right? So what's next to Turkey? I was in Istanbul at the time and she said Bulgaria is next to Turkey. So I Googled Bulgaria and found Plovdiv, which is the oldest uh, continually serving uh, city in Europe. I mean, there's older cities, but they're now, you know, ruins. This one's been there and still running. And I said, give me a bus. I'm going to Plovdiv. <laughs> so that's what I did. Uh, we would, did research for American Trader. I went to Taiwan and wanted to go to Australia. And she said, you know, Australia is not near Taiwan, right? <laughs> so she's the one that plans all that. She does. She keeps up on the social media. I mean, I do the posts on social media. She's, she, you know, if I get a message, she'll let me know. Um, um, all the marketing, everything. This I write the books, basically, and the DCOE does everything else. If I'm not mistaken, she's holding the camera on a lot of your Instagrams, and she'll be talk, you know, kind of teeing you up. And I'm like, this yeah, yeah. gal is a marketing marvel. So now I know where Jennifer comes from. Yeah, there's some pieces of my wife in there, that's for sure. But I've also served a lot of females as well, so she's kind of an amalgamation as well. Yeah. 
And uh, how did Knuckles come up with his nickname? Another one of those little tidbits I want to know. Well, you're going to make my wife's ears burn. She came up with that. <laughs> so we were, uh, um, we all had call signs, you know, in my old unit, but I didn't want to use a call sign that somebody else had. They think I'm talking about them. So you have to come up with a brand new one you've never heard before. Otherwise, they'll say, hey, you're, you can't, you know, I don't act like that. And I'm like, well, it's not you. It's just I use your call sign. Um, and so I'm sitting there typing the very first book. And I said, I need a call sign. And she said, how about Knuckles? And I was like, why Knuckles? Because you're all a bunch of knuckle draggers. And I was like, oh, OK, that works. See, this is the inside scoop that I love. That is awesome. High five, double high fives to your wife. Hey, and, uh, you know, before we get off of her and get on to something else, I do want to know this because I, I got to, you've been together a long time. You got two daughters, two, two grown daughters. You've been together a long time. What's the secret to a happy marriage, Brad? You can tell us right here. It's, it's not uh, Oprah. It's, it's, it's still the thriller zone. It's saying yes, dear. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. We've been married 33 years, so it's wow. been together for a long time. Wow. I mean, she was a, she was a financial analyst. She was uh, doing media evaluations, believe it or not, and uh, working full time. And then when I started writing two books a year, it just got to be overwhelming. You're doing two book tours. I was still doing security contracting. I was writing two novellas a year as well. Uh, and I, I just couldn't do anything else. And so she left her job and said, I'm going to pick up all the slack. You just write the books. I'll do everything else. And so that's what she does. Honey, did you hear that? <laughs> My wife, Tammy, is, she's, I bet you she's wired a whole lot like your wife. She has, she loves spreadsheets and algorithms and, and word documents and minutia of detail. Like she can pull out taxes and have them done in like a half hour. And you, you say the word HR block, I'm going to break out in the hive. It's just crazy. She actually does our taxes as well. So. <laughs> One last thing about Inside Scoop, then we're going to get back to you. Uh, so we found out about Knuckles and we found out about Jennifer uh, Pike again. We, we found out of where he came from. But how about that? Is that a nickname of somebody in your past? Is it just one? Did, did she come up with that? As well? No, that's actually I came up with it. It was it's not a, it's not a call sign of anybody I knew. And that's kind of the reason I chose it. But you always have to have a call sign that's not you don't get it for a good reason you get it for something you've done that's wrong. And so in the very first book, it describes why he uh, got the call sign Pike. And same for Knuckles. I actually wrote a, my very first novella is called The Call Sign, which basically details how Knuckles got his call sign. And I'm going to have to go back and read that. <laughs> no, basically he knocks out a, uh, a jackass CIA guy, hits him so hard he leaves Knuckles imprints on his face. And so he ends up with a call sign Knuckles. Copy that. Okay. Now, let's talk about you for a second uh, before we wrap this up, because I, I don't want to take all your time today. But what do you miss? And I'm curious about this. Uh, what do you miss most about being on the, in the service on a daily basis? I miss most the mission itself, uh, serving. It's, uh, I mean, I don't miss the deployments. I don't miss, there's a lot of things I don't miss. But I miss the camaraderie. I miss the fact that everybody is in there for a singular reason. And yeah. you all have a driving focus on what you want to do. You don't really see that in the civilian world. Uh, that's probably the thing I miss the most. Do you think that's also the hardest thing to come back to? I, I think of the movie Sniper um, and about how much how Chris had a hard time coming home back to reality because being in the shit was really kind of what his whole focus was and that was his calling. Do you find it, it's a similar thing that you'd like, man, I, I missed that complete focus to one goal? Well, you do. And I'll tell you that uh, you don't really um... – you don't realize you're living like that. I mean, everybody is living with this enormous pressure cooker, especially I was, in, like I said, I was a special mission unit and you're deploying constantly and it's just an enormous pressure cooker. And when I came down here to teach at the Citadel, I actually, it was kind of like, this is how everybody else lives. I mean, you yeah. don't realize it because you're, everybody's doing the same thing you are. You think that's just life. This is what it's like. Uh, and then actually I, the decision to retire from the army because the book sold, I told Elaine, I was like, you know, I don't, you know, should I, I'd come out on a promotion list to Colonel, you know, should I take the promotion? My next assignment was two years on a company to Pakistan. Um, and uh, she said, you know, if you want to go back to Fort Bragg, you shouldn't have brought me to Charleston. Oh, so I had to give writing a try, which. Yeah. Well, 
and you probably haven't looked back. I mean, come on, dude. It's it's no easy feat to do. You know, you're approaching two dozen. It won't be long. And when you have that kind of success, and I don't know when the New York Times bestselling author uh, badge got put on top of your book. How far back was that ballpark? Believe it or not, book one. <sighs> okay, where's my mic? I got to drop it. Um I mean, I, what are the chances of that even happening? Do you think, all right, first of all, that's rhetorical. Um, second of all, do you think that to come out of the gate <laughs> with book one could be done today? No. Uh, I, I Every single one of my books has hit the New York Times bestseller list. And uh, I don't think this one will, because if you look at the list now, um, they're out of uh, you know the top 15. 14 of them have been on the list for 35 weeks. Uh, so it's, I don't know what has changed, but it used to be every week you'd see a new book, you know, five new books on the list. And then they maybe last two weeks and drop off. Uh, well, when where the crawdad scene came out, it set some kind of trend 297 day weeks on the list. Yeah. And so there, every, if you look at the New York times list now, you, it'll tell you how many weeks they've been on it. And you know, 35 weeks, 15 weeks, things like that. It's harder now, isn't it? It's the competition's keen. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what has changed, but you used to never see that. And, it, and they always change how they look at it and, and what stores are feeding into it. And, and that's all their, you know, magic chicken bones are rolling because, you know, for a while there, they didn't look at Amazon at all. Then they realized Amazon's selling more books than every bookstore in the world. And so they had to figure out, you know, they used to not take Costco sales. I think they do now. I'm not really sure. Uh, but they're constantly changing their feeds, trying to figure out, okay, how do we figure this out? Do you think, now this is a very uh, pointed question and it's just purely your opinion, but I have so many listeners who are aspiring writers. Do you, do you see and say to yourself, you know, if this were me, if I were coming up today, I would go head down, follow your passion, just keep going. Or do you say in the back of your mind in those quiet hours going, geez, that's, uh, that's nearly insurmountable. Maybe I should think about something else. I know it's a loaded question. No, I actually, uh, and I know exactly what you mean. I, I knew nothing about the publishing world when I tried to get published my, for the first time. And lightning struck for me. I was extremely lucky. If I had known how hard it is to get published, I probably would have gone back to Fort Bragg. I, mean, I had no idea how hard it was. In fact, when I made the list for the first book, my publisher was just going crazy. And I was kind of like, well, you didn't expect it? You know? I, I had no idea how hard, how hard that was. I just didn't understand the publishing world, how much competition there is and everything else. Yeah. Uh, looking back on it now, I, I was extremely lucky and I was extremely fortunate for what happened to me. Um, uh, but I, at the time, I didn't realize it. But does do so to this same point because you made a comment that I'm not even sure this will make the list. I, I think it's going to make the list. It's such a solid book. But that notwithstanding, do you think? Do you sit there and say to yourself? geez, if this landscape is shifting, maybe my best days are behind me. Or do you, I mean, I'm just curious how, how that. No, I don't. I think the, the one thing I believe is that uh, people read, they just read. Things can shift as far as eBooks and, and, you know, the, the uh, methodology of sale, like Amazon, when they came on, you know, the thing that scares a lot of people, Costco is another one. They sell a lot of books, uh, but they, the books are not making a profit for them. They make no money off books. Right. Amazon, uh, they probably do now, but when they were first doing it, they were selling for the Kindle. That's where they made their money. They wanted to sell a Kindle. Right. So they would sell the Kindle for whatever it is, $200. And then they sell all the books. They could buy them. From, I'm just making numbers up now. Sure. You know, they buy them from the publisher for a quarter and then they'd sell them for a dime. They're losing money on the books. And that what concerned me was if one day they said, no, nah, we tried it. It's not working after they've driven all the bookstores out of business, it's not working anymore. Let's focus on something else. And they quit selling books. And Costco kind of did that. They were selling a ton of books at a huge discount. And the purpose of it was to get you into the store. You're going to buy that new book because it's super cheap. Oh, and look, there's a beach chair. Yeah. Oh, look over there. I can get some, you know, this big tub of lard. I'm going to go to the store and, and buy this with my book. Yeah. Well, then uh, two years ago, they said, we're not going to sell all these books anymore. We're going to sell. They started focusing on memoirs like Spare. I'm sure they've got a pallet of those. 
uh, memoirs, and then the top tier, John Grisham, Tom Clancy, was about the only books you would see in there. So it's then that shift is, you know, we were selling a lot of books to Costco, and then they just said, well, we decided not to do that anymore. So it causes a reverberation. Now, the good news is that Barnes & Noble's come back. Yes. They're talking about open 30 stores this year uh, wow. instead of closing them all. They've done a really good job. The stock price is up, and, they're, and it's because it got back to selling books and not selling trinkets, you know. I remember the time you'd walk into Barnes and Noble and, you know, between the Starbucks, no offense to Starbucks, we love Starbucks, uh, but between that and the tchotchkes and the jewelry and the this, that, and the other, I'm like, what happened to the books? Right. right. And, and then they opened the record store in the back and the DVDs. Mm -hmm. And now I, I'm one of those guys that I go to the Barnes and Noble as much as I can or other, any other little bookstore like Warwick's downtown La Jolla, one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. Books. I've done a book signing there. Yeah. Great people. Nancy and all those guys. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe that we should support those guys, but man, it is so refreshing. And you make a great point, Brad. I mean, people are always going to read. Now, people are going to tell you, oh, our attention spans are getting shorter and la, la, la. Yes, maybe. TikTok is probably part of the demon <laughs> behind all that. But we still love storytelling. We love to read great stories. We love to be lost and carried away to these other worlds. I mean, that's since the beginning of time, right? Right. Yeah. And people are going to read. They're, they'll, I, I firmly believe they'll always read. And there'll always be a segment that says, I have to have a physical book. Others say combined book. I mean, you mentioned TikTok. Uh, Colleen Hoover on the combined um, ebook print side of the house for New York Times, she has five books on that list. And she has five books on that list because of TikTok. Yeah. So there's I mean, that's the one thing that I, I really don't like about publishing. Um, I mean, I, I don't mind it, I guess, but it's, it, you're, it's always some new thing. You know, oh, I got to get a new account on this and I got to compete with that. And, you know, for a while there was like, uh, my publisher's like, you got to start a Pinterest page. And I said, no, I'm done. You know, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. That's, that's the limit I'm doing. Um, when, when I started hearing agents at conferences talking about, you got to get a platform, your platform's got to be solid platform, platform. And well, what is that? You got to be on all the social media channels. And I, I always heard that and I went, I get it. I see where you're going. It helps the marketing, which basically means is pretty much up to us, a large part of that. I know you yeah, agree yeah. with that. But but moreover, shouldn't I be writing books? Right. Yeah. Isn't That's that what I actually say over and over again is that uh, it's the writing that matters. At the end of the day, it is the writing that matters. Now, there's Certain ways, that, I mean, there's certain things that will always happen where something, you know, goes viral for whatever reason on pick a platform. And then that person writes a book. Well, that's probably going to sell a lot because she went viral once. But if the writing is not solid, she's not selling another one. I mean, that'll be it. Yeah. And you and I both know we could rattle off uh, if we were a less than kind, rattle off any number of list of people that we know who came out of the gate with a huge smash hit. And then they took the social media angle and became, you know, influencers and only to find out that their second book. Yeah. Yeah. And I wish them all well. <clears throat> Listen, we're all here to just perfect our craft, right? Yeah, definitely. I want to say this. I see you dedicated this book, The Devil's Ransom, in case anyone hasn't paid attention to that glorious beast lately. Uh, dedicated to longtime editor David Highfill. Now, two-part question. First of all, it was very kind of you to do that. How long were you guys together, and what was the biggest lesson you learned? Because I got a feeling you, you he's been with you day one, maybe? No, no. He's uh, uh, This was my third book with him. Okay. Okay. Um, I moved over to Moro uh, a few years ago now. Um, and uh, he's been fantastic. And he, this is the, actually, I have the pleasure of, this is his very last book. I'm the last book he ever did. Wow. And he's moved on to something else and I hated to lose him. Um, and sometimes we got in big fights. So in, um, I opened up into days into days actually has a serial killer in it. And uh, I opened up into, into days with this guy killing a girl. Um, and it's a gory scene, blood everywhere. You know, it's just, a, uh, it sets the tone for me. It was like, that's perfect. We're going to start the book off with that. There's your, the lie grabber. Sure. Everybody's going to want to know what the hell happened here. Yeah. 
He said, no, you're, you're not open the scene with the murder of a female. <laughs> that's, that's not happening. We're not putting that in the book. And so I fought him and fought him. And uh, he was like, no, we're not going to do that. And so I, uh, I saved that chapter. I have it. I may sell it as a separate, just one chapter. Um, but uh, he had a good point. The, you know, the very next scene, which starts the plot going down, now the guy that does the killing is obviously integral to the plot. Uh, but the terrorist thread starts in the next scene and it's a, a, a paragliding assassination basically uh, yeah. in Switzerland. And um, he said, you've got this other scene right after it. You know, there's no reason to do that. And I was like, okay, I can see that. And now reading it, I'm like, yeah, he's, he's right. This flows a lot better instead of starting off with the Jack, the Ripper scene, start off with, with the guy, the Mossad head of the Mossad, the Ram said getting killed in uh, Switzerland. Do you think there was more? I have a very specific reason for asking this. Do you think he had more of a reason for you not to start that way than just the fact that your second or third scene was equally as good or better? Uh, I, I think it, it actually may have been. I think he may have been afraid of the uh, female angle that okay. the females getting killed right up the bat, and it's just not. People don't want to read about that, and it's not. Uh, it's something that's. Because later on in the book, he's doing another killing, and, and he's not—he's trying to escape, and so he's in this dorm room, and he kills a female to get out of there, and steals her bicycle, and pedals away. Um, and um, he was like, you know, we're not going to—you you killing all these females? And I said, well, because it didn't bother me. It was lick. I was like, I'll make him a male student. How's that? Oh, okay, do that. <laughs> <laughs> so the scene's still in there. He just went from female to male. Okay, well. Folks, the the book is The Devil's Ransom. Uh, we're not wrapped just yet. I still got a couple of two more little tricks up my sleeve, but I do want to say Pike Logan is back and he's uh, he's kicking ass, is it, which is exactly what you'd expect him to do. Yeah. And the ND, I'm t Brad, by the way, tell me inside scoop. I'll keep it between us. Somebody's optioning this for a movie, right? Uh, they, I've gotten a lot of uh, um, threads, I guess I'd say. Uh, and we'll see if they come to fruition. It, it's, it takes so long before, you know, anything actually happens that uh, um, I'm talking with some people right now, as a matter of fact, and, you know, if it goes somewhere, it goes somewhere. Usually you end up talking for nine months and then it just fades away. So, yeah. so far it hasn't happened. You either t talk forever and it fades away or you talk for a short amount of time and they buy the option and then they fade away and nothing ever happens. And then they yeah. come back and they renew the option and then they right. fade away. And then everyone's lost interest in it. I don't know. It's Hollywood is a fickle little. And um, that's not a huge goal of mine. I don't sit there and think at night, you know, boy, I really wait for this to happen. If it happens, it happens. But, I, you know, usually what I say is I, I write books. I don't write screenplays. So, yeah. You know, if I really want to be blunt, I'd say, do you read? Ah. <laughs> If you want to go watch a movie, go watch a movie. But I write books. It'd be nice. Don't get me wrong. I'd love it for it to happen, but it's yeah. not. It doesn't keep me up at night. Well, how about since we are kicking off the new season four um, with uh, you know it's a whole new year. You're my first guest. Uh, if if you, I don't know if you ever listened to the show before. We do this little thing called rapid fire questions. Nobody gets hurt. It's super easy. You want you want to play? Uh, sure. Okay. Good. When writing, do you prefer silent solitude or a crowded cafe? Uh, I can write anywhere. I had learned that. I've written, uh, wrote my first book at uh, volleyball tournaments, gymnastics meets, on airplanes, in bars. Uh, I have the ability to just turn everything off. I don't even have a writing desk. People say, you know, what's on your writing desk? I don't have one. Uh, I'm sitting on an actual, believe it or not, if I could show you my desk I'm on right now, it's a beer pong table my daughter made in college. Uh, so I, I, I just pack my computer up and I go. Sometimes I'll go to uh, Waterfront Park and they have some free Wi-Fi out there. Other times I'll go to the library. I, it doesn't bother me one way or the other. Uh, let me interject a real quick thing. You said free Wi-Fi. I have this conversation with my wife quite often. I said, honey, you, you, you aren't surfing the web at a coffee shop, right? Well, yeah, it's free Wi-Fi. I'm like, are you using a private VPN? Huh? I'm like, you know, I can get into your computer and see everything. What? <laughs> so, uh, word to the wise there. Oh yeah, I've used that in a, a book before. The uh, and, and people ask me all the time, are you writing about 
you know, how do you keep from writing about classified stuff? Well, I just don't write about classified stuff. That's how I keep from doing it. And yeah. so usually what I do is I, uh, um, I look at what criminals are doing. And in New York City, so every time you go into your house, your phone will hook up to the Wi-Fi. Very few people say, "Turn, ask me every time to hook up. If it's a network they know, it automatically hooks up. So it saves you the trouble. And so they hovered a drone that spoofed the Starbucks Wi-Fi. It was a block away. Everybody that came to the light, the phone thought it wouldn't. It, they'd read it in Starbucks, hooked up to the drone, and they drained all the personal information out of the phone. So I used that in the book. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I'll use that. <laughs> We're going to use that as a highlight of the show. That's juicy, dude. Yeah, I was, I did, because you don't want to, you know, there's multiple ways to track a cell phone. Yes. And I didn't want to use the same old, same old that I'd used in past books. And so I was looking for a way, how can I find this phone? And I saw what they did and I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a drone up and it's going to fly overhead. And when that phone connects, he's going to bing, it's in that building. Yeah, and nobody wants to turn off. Well, you could just turn off your phone. I know, but what if somebody calls me or somebody texts me? I got to answer their text. Yeah. Shouldn't we be uh, I mean, I am guilty of it too. Bluetooth's one of the easiest things to penetrate, and, and Bluetooth's on my phone all the time. It's just because sure. I want to hook up a headset. I don't want to sit there and mess with my phone. Yeah. Uh, but I should have it turned off because it's easy to penetrate. Well, my favorite thing, to, to since I'm drilling down this and taking away from rapid fire questions, I, I don't know what they're called exactly. I, I'll look this up later, Brad, and get back to you. But you can get a little pouch. It You, you can put your phone in it, zip it, and it, it's got yeah, some yeah. kind of What's Fair, it? Uh, Faraday pouch. Thank you. And it blocks any incoming or outgoing signals. Yeah. yeah. So if all of a sudden you needed to get it, you could without having to turn it on and off. So look at us hacking the system. <laughs> ransomware we didn't even talk about that all right uh question number two rapid fire questions uh paper or keyboard i'm i know that now uh it's no it's a little bit of both i have i don't have my journal in here i carry a journal around with me everywhere i go yeah uh, a little leather bound journal and when i'm um and something strikes me if i'm out driving around i'll pull over and write it down uh sometimes it's old paragraphs sometimes it's just like one two three four uh and so people ask me all the time you know do you uh, when do you write? And what they really mean is when do you type? Uh, right. Because I'm always writing. And right. some days I won't type anything because I'm trying to write, trying to figure this out. And I'll use my journal to sketch things and things like that. And then when it comes time to type, I can bang it out. My record actually is uh, 8,000 words a day for two or four days. Set a world record on that one. AK Fort Straight. Yeah. <laughs> Deadline. Quite, quite the impetus, right? <laughs> Wow. Um, and it's funny, uh, side note, we'll, uh, Tammy and I'll be taking cross country trips. We go like to Colorado Springs to visit the grandkids a whole lot. And I uh, will be driving along, just me driving. And I'll be lost. And she's like, where are you? And before I can ask, she goes, oh, working on a book. I'm like, yeah. I mean, because yeah, yeah. doing this, when you're when you're focused on one thing that you have to pay attention, it allows the other sphere of your brain to just really create. And I'm just always working out little tiny things. Well, what if that? Oh, well, there, well, that, and you got hours, Brad. You got hours. Huh? Well, yeah, that yeah. won't work because then, and then if you're planting seeds, I don't have to be writing it down because, you know, we should have the ability, right, to remember that stuff. So, yeah, Elaine says the same thing too. She's uh, absolutely says that. Yeah. She actually, I can't remember what the phrase is. I think she calls it Brad World. Are you in Brad World? <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Brad World, favorite environment, Texas or South Carolina? That would be close. You're going to make me choose two of my favorite places. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say South Carolina right now because I get the, just because of where Charleston is. Yeah. Uh, but Texas has a lot for it. There's, there's not a lot of shooting ranges out here in Texas. They're all over the place. Yeah. You're going to give up something for something else. Okay. Uh, along a similar vein, are you a barbecue ribs fan kind of guy? Yeah. Okay. Texas or South Carolina? Then that, that's also you're getting a huge debate on that one. I like Texas barbecue, but I can't, you know, well, actually, I should say we have a barbecue shop here, Lewis Barbecue, some of the best barbecue in the world. And he's from Austin, Texas. OK, so it's kind of hard to say, you know, is when he cooks it, he's still got a lot of Texas stuff to it. So I love that barbecue. Yeah, you're that's almost politically correct right there. I mean, you you're 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 safe both ways. Well, I can say I don't like North Carolina barbecue with a mustard sauce. I don't like that. So there we go. 
I was going to say, and then you get up in Carolina, which is, I'm from Winston-Salem. So you oh, get, yeah, yeah. A, yeah, you get into the red versus the vinegar versus the, yeah. you know, and I'm just like, whatever you like, just eat it. Okay. Just give me the hush puppies and the crinkle cut fries and a sweet tea and but leave me alone. Okay. Last question, long trip. What's your favorite music for you and the wife to enjoy? I mean, you, you get to pick, it can be a genre, it can be a band. You're just taking a long, maybe you're heading out to Texas and you're just thinking, hmm, here, here's uh, a good we have uh, actually it would be i have a pike logan spotify playlist which is a curated list of songs and every time we go on a long trip i'm like put on spotify let's start the playlist and it's an eclectic mix of music everything from country to uh, pseudo punk you know garbage uh, those kind of bands yeah. um, it's got a ton of different songs now here's an interesting question. I hope I I I do the same thing. I create little uh, playlists for different books that I'm writing. So when you listen to the music, do you listen? Do you build the playlists for the Pike World so that you're listening to it while you're creating the world, like motivation, or do you do it more like, oh, if I were writing a soundtrack to Pike's life, pretend it's a movie for easy understanding. These are the songs that I would be playing along with it. The some of the songs that are on the list are uh, because when I heard the song, I was like, "That's like Red Light King's Bullet in My Hand." I'm like, "That's Pike right there." That's yeah. every lyric in there matches up to Pike. But other ones are just songs that mean something to me. I mean, I just, I've got songs all the way from the '80s, you know, '70s, all the way out, just because it's a song that means something to me at a certain moment in my life. You know, I've got songs. I had a running soundtrack that I had in Iraq. Uh, that I would work out to. Well, those songs are on the playlist because that means something to me. Doesn't mean anything to my writing career, but they're just songs that I, I wanted to put on there. Nice. Yeah, I'm telling you, the music is such an integral part of writing a story. I, I'm thinking of like Zero Dark Thirty and these guys, like Hans Zimmer, these guys who create this music. Yeah. I'll listen to over and over. Born Identity, anything to do with that kind of soundtrack, just especially for action. And when I was reading your fight, when you're getting down to the last uh five six seven eight chapters and by the way i meant to tell you this one of my favorite things i think it's a trend going on now i love how you have just it's just stacked full of dialogue i mean it's just conversation conversation because you know you're setting up the scene early on i get that but boy when you really get into the these people are just nailing the uh dialogue back and forth and the and the tension of the action is going pow, 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 pow. I'm like you're flying through those last few chapters. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, that's what you try to set out to do. <laughs> Obviously, you don't want to go <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. How about a wet blanket for the big finale, anyone? Yeah. All right, as we get to wrap, uh, Brad, you've been so gracious with your time. I want to ask you, and and we kind of hinted at this early on, but it's I end every single show with this. What is Brad Taylor's best piece of writing advice for aspiring writers? And I, you know, I, there's a dozen out there, but I'd love to know, especially with your 16 books in the track record and the decades that you put into that. What would you say if you had to narrow it down? And it can be a couple of points, but. Well, it's I get asked this a lot, and and my answer is going to sound trite, um, but it's right. It's write a book. I, I get asked all the time. You know, I have a great outline. How do I get an agent? How do I get a publisher? I'm like, write the book first. Spend yeah. all your time focusing on the writing because that is what's going to matter. At the end of the day, they don't care. You know, you could design your own cover art and say it's the best ever. They're going to read what you wrote, and you need to make what you wrote the best thing there is. If it's a I guess for a technical aspect, I would say um, uh, for an aspiring writer that isn't published yet, it would be to hire a freelance editor. When yeah. you've made it the best you can, when your friends have read it, your reading group, your, whoever you use to bounce ideas off of and whoever you use to give you advice, which I did, obviously, um, they, they can't beat a freelance editor. If you get a freelance editor, they're going to go through it page by page. I, when I wrote Run Run For Man, you notice in – even in the devil's rants of every book I've written, when Pike's on the page, he's in first person. Yes. Uh, I love that. Anybody else on the page is in third person. Yep. Uh, when it's their chapter. Well, when I wrote my first book, it was all third person. And um, my freelance editor gave me this writing assignment, which I was like, what am I in high school? And she said, you know, send me, I want to know uh, everything about Pike. I want him to write his biography in first person. So I was really um, obnoxious. And remember the movie, The Jerk? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, I opened it up with, uh, I was born a poor black man. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know, just being a real smart aleck all the way through it. And um, she said, that's some of the best writing you've done yet. You need to change. Anytime Pike's on the scene, put him in first person. And I was like, what? I mean, because that's a lot of work. And um, I did. And I saw where she was coming from. I was like, I can get a lot more out here on the page. There's a lot more emotion that I can get through Pike in first person. And so that's what I did. But that, that was a freelance editor. Nobody, no friend of mine is going to say that. They don't know POV. They wouldn't even know what POV meant. They just read the thing and say, I like it or I don't like it. Or I have questions on what's this. And didn't you forget about that type stuff? which is good to have a second reader do that stuff, beta reader do that. But a freelance editor can really polish the book up. Because when, nowadays, it, even when I was trying to get published, it hits the agent's desk and uh, he's got probably 10 manuscripts there. If he reads the first paragraph and there's two typos in it, there goes that one. Don't have to spend yeah. more time on that. Nobody's looking for a diamond in the rough. They're all looking for a diamond. Oh, well put. Best piece of advice. That is it. Uh, and Brad, you know what I love about that is that, you know, you hear a lot of people say, uh, best, put your best foot forward. And I'm, I'm going to say this to self-published people who were, who were dipping their toe in the water before they try to go for the, the big five, we'll call it, <laughs> whatever it is when this airs. And it's this. <laughs> yeah. I made that mistake. I thought I was so excited to just see it in print and somebody pick it up. I didn't. Oh, yeah, yeah. There might be a little typo here and there or whatever. It, not a big deal. No bueno. Because you know what? The reader's too educated and they won't put up with typos no, no. or silliness. They're like, oh. Well, because- I mean, it, and it doesn't matter. I, you know, this is the uh, Devil's Ransom is the 17th book coming out in January. And, uh, I mean, I've read it a thousand times. My wife's my first reader. I have the editor who's read it. Uh, I have copy editor re- reads it, and then a proofreader reads it. I mean, there's at least six people reading this manuscript, and there will be a mistake in it. There always yeah. is. Uh, you just can't help it. There was one line in this book, uh, and I think it's still in there because I didn't find it until afterwards. Um, he pulled out the last quiver of his arrow instead of the last arrow in his quiver. Well, everybody just, when you read it, you just kind of say, I know that saying and scanned over it. Right. And I got an email. No, it was an end of days because I got an email on it already saying, I think you meant this. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> it's just happens. Yeah. Well, best advice. That is true. You know, what is the old saying my, my mom used to say? You can't make a first impression right. twice. Yeah. So good on you. Well, folks, if you want to learn more, visit bradtaylorbooks.com, built by authorbytes.com, I might uh, mention that we mentioned earlier, and uh, follow him on Twitter with the same handle. But, man, I got to tell you something. This has been so awesome. Brad, thanks for putting up with the uh, technical issues at the beginning. Well, I hadn't, too. So, <laughs> and, and let's do this. Can we make a promise to each other and just kind of, Shake across the way. Yeah, shake, shake, shake that we won't let another year go by uh, yeah. or too much without connecting because I feel like hanging out with you for this 59 minutes that we've known each other forever. And I'm I'm just so honored that you took time for me. No, it's been great fun. I appreciate it. And if they, you know, they go to the website, there's excerpts of every single book is on the website so they can get a flavor for free. Okay. Well, Pike Logan is alive and kicking. Oh, and do you... Th- um, is it safe to assume he's going to be around for a while? Yes. I'm banging away on uh, the 18th book right now. Of course you are. It's giving me fits, as usual. Yeah. Well, get that uh, a DCOE to help you on some of those hurdles, huh? Definitely. <laughs> Brad Taylor, once again, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. How fun was that, huh? Brad Taylor, The Devil's Ransom, coming out one week Next Tuesday, 24th. And, you know, one of those books that you pick up and you think, oh, I'll just, I'll just read a couple of chapters and then I'll, you know, I'll put it down. That might be the case early on. But boy, when it starts picking up speed, hard to put this baby down. And as I said in the show, you want to learn more? Go to bradtaylorbooks.com. Folks, want to say welcome once again to season four. It's going to be a great year. We have so many rock star authors lined up. I could rattle them off, but I'm not going to. It's part of the surprise. Until next time, keep reading, keep writing, 
and keep it locked in on The Thriller Zone.